Hello. So I saw a couple of people had a little bit of confusion on this problem. In particular, they weren't really having trouble with the first part it didn't look like. It looked like they were trouble with the logs and how you solved this question. So I'm going to skim through part of it, get to where I think the most important parts were, and then I'll cover the actual simplification of the function that we had to do here. So first thing is they just start off some basic rules, how we're going to use this. They draw products bring our math tools. In this case, though, this is just a summation, add up all the terms of x. We've done that before. If instead we do the product, I have the capital pi. That's going to multiply each term. So we had to write it out. Uh, I did this probably the most straightforward, basic way you could. But it works. <laughs> I run it down here. It still works. Uh, I'm pretty close you multiply all the terms then divide by all the terms you should get one back sometimes it does sometimes off by a little bit but it passes for multiplication division of a bunch of floats now next thing we get to and this is where the tricky parts kind of begin uh gaussian distribution which is just a probability density function this way say we have to know probability when we take this class the gaussian distribution is given by this function and what that means is if I plug in a lot of values of x, I'll eventually be able to graph out what the distribution of probability would look like. Now, the important thing to remember about this, I'm just going to harp on it for a second, is since it's probability distribution function, any value of x I put in here, this is going to return a decimal. So we had to write a function that provided g of x for a particular x. And literally, we I broke mine down. I did the first term as its own float, calculate the power, then actually run the exponential to that power, and return our first term times our second term. And we see it works. Run the test cell. It works. And then we get our next one, which is simply, if I give you a list of values, I want you to give me back a list of the different Gaussians. So I wrote it. I said, hey, make a list. Now for every element in the list that they gave us, go ahead and append on the Gaussian of that particular value. Oh, don't want to do that. OK. And then return the result. I run it. I get it. And you see these values can be pretty small decimals. I'll run the test cell anyways. Passes. Now we got into what's called maximum likelihood estimation. Now the good news is for this problem, you don't actually have to understand this too well. What you do need to know is that all of these values, x sub 0, x sub 1, all the way to x sub n minus 1, that's a set of n data points. The likelihood of these of this group of data is given by this function. It's a large product. Now, this individual value is a probability. And in this case, we're going to use the normal or Gaussian distribution. So what you're doing is saying, what's the normal for this given x? We get a whole bunch of those put together, multiply them all times each other, and we're going to get some value. So we just had to implement this. So this is what they gave us. G all is going to be a list because you're getting all the individual values of x running through Gaussians. And we know Gaussians returns a list. So G all is a list of individual Gaussian values. L is going to be the product of g all. And if we look, our little list x isn't that long. We multiply all those decimals times each other. We get 1.15 uh, times 10 to the negative 14th. So pretty small decimal. And that's fine. But remember, each of those values were decimals. And we multiply a bunch of decimals times each other. The number gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So eventually, we're going to 0 because the float can only be so accurate. So this is where we get down to 
the trick we're going to use, which is using log. That using log, here's why it's important. So I'm going to go over our first rule of logs, which we're going to need. That when I have that list, they're finding individual Gaussian values from this function. And just want to make sure I write this down right. <laughs> okay, it's easy to forget terms. Okay, but what they're going to do is say, well, all these terms, we then get a whole bunch of g of x's as many as we need. And then what we're going to do is multiply them all times each other. Well, these are all decimals that get smaller and smaller. It's going to equal some number. But what I can do is I can take the log of each side. And when I do that, I get to use this rule. That the log of a times b is equal to the log of a plus the log of b. And what this does for me is instead of multiplying decimals times each other, I'll start adding numbers together. Now, if these numbers are positive, I could grow to positive infinity. If they're negative, well, the exact opposite. So I could have another problem, which is that I could go to a number that the computer can no longer show also, but it'll be infinity instead of zero. And in fact, that is what they show has happened. That when they run this, the number is getting more and more negative. And in fact, it goes from negative 582 to negative infinity pretty quickly. So it's not a whole lot better, but it does help us a little bit. So we get to our last part, which is let's use the fact of what's going on here to come up with a different way that can handle more values of n. And the trick was up here. When we said take the log of all of these values and then we sum them up, we're going to get the log of r which was what all those multiplied by together were going to be. But when I say take the log of x1, I'm really saying take the log of whatever the output of this is. I'm saying take the log of g of x. If I do it to one side of the equation, I have to do it to the other. And if I do that, I can distribute that log across this function by using the rules of logarithms. I have a term times another term, which means I can break my log apart into two terms. And because they're multiplied, it means add them together. And there's my first rule I applied. I use the multiplication rule. Well, now I have log of a division going on. And the rule for log and division of division, well, multiplication is going to be addition. I want inverse operations. It turns out they are inverse operations. It's going to be the log of A minus the log of B. So I have the log of 1 minus the log of sigma times the square root of 2 pi. Then I get to bring all this over. I'm just going to copy this down for now. We'll do one simplification step at a time. Now, if you're watching this, you may have already realized, and I'm hoping I haven't broken this down too simplified, but hopefully you'll recognize this, that 
log, what we're saying is with log, with the natural log this way, the basic log, we're saying this equals some number. What I'm saying is I want to know the number that I have to raise e to to get 1. Well, that means log of 1 has to be equal to 0. I raise e to the 0 power, that's how I get 1. So this term reduces to 0. I don't even need it anymore. So I'm just going to prop that down. It's not even really a simplification. Now I look at my second part. And this is where they give us a hint in the instructions, a reminder that log of an exponential is equal to whatever the exponential is being raised to. And this is the way the computer writes is exponential of x. That's the power. x is the power. So log and exponent cancel. And the power just comes down in its place. And now we can actually simplify these in that, that negative one half. I'm going to turn it to a decimal. I'm going to leave this first term intact. And I'll explain why in just a moment. Let's simplify this bit. That positive, all of this, plus all this, this can become a negative. That decimal is 0.5. Bring this down exactly as it is because x is our variable. Mu is going to be handed to us in our function. Sigma is going to be handed to us in our function, and then we're going to square it. Now, I'm going to explain very briefly why I'm not going to break this apart. This is a float when you put it inside of the computer. You're going to get a float. Pi has ensured you're going to get a float. The square root of 2 by itself, you're going to get a float. But this is a float. If I break this log apart, what I'd have is a log of a float plus another log of a float. That's two floats, where if instead the computer calculates all this at once, this is one float and then the log of it, which is a log of a single float rather than two floats. I want to minimize addition and subtraction of floats if I can. If I break this apart, I'm going to be summing two floats. I don't want to do that. From what we saw earlier in the exercises, that can actually increase error. So I'm going to leave this term as it is. Much the same way, I'm going to leave this term as it is. And remember, what this is giving me is the log of what the output would have been. So now let's go over to our code again. That when they hand me that list of x's, now, these are all different Gaussians. I want to apply that function that we just wrote to each one of them. So my result is an empty list. Or that's where I'm going to save the individual pieces. For every value inside of the large list they pass me, add it onto my temporary container. And this is exactly what we'd written down. I've reversed the order. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I didn't reverse order. This order I had on my paper. Negative log of sigma times the square root of 2 times pi. That's his first term. Then I'm going to subtract 0.5 times this entire term, which is this big old ugly term right here. And when I do that, I'm going to get all those individual logs that I needed. That's going to be log of x1. The next time it passes through, it's going to get log of x2. And it's going to get me log of x3. All the way until it's gotten all the way to the end. However many were in that list. This is now inside of my variable res or result as I call it. <laughs> and now all I have to do is as we saw from our earlier math when we have 
log being split across that way. We then add all the terms together and then return the result. Now this is not the exact same solution that was provided as a sample solution, but mathematically it is equivalent. They did some other things to, uh, I maybe it's more Pythonic and I'm not Pythonic. I just try to make a solution that I can follow pretty easily. We pass it in, it passes a test. I then run it through the large test, which of course takes a couple of moments and it passes. But hopefully that explained what was going on with this function. That we had the original way we found an individual Gaussian. That function was used to make a list of Gaussians that they want to multiply together to get some value r. Because of the way this value would reduce to zero, we tried taking a log of both sides. And because of the multiplication rule, those individual values would then be added up. But this has a problem of possibly shrinking to negative infinity. But each of these individual values was coming from this function. So when we said take log of x1, we were saying take the log of the output of this function, which means take the log of the input of this function. And then we work through the simplification for why we ended up with the code that we did. Last thing I'm going to include, and you can pause the video here if you want to go back over this. Last thing I'm going to write down are the quick log rules that come up most often. And these are pretty useful. First off, log of e to the x is just going to spit out x. Similarly, when you apply the e function of log x, that's going to simplify to just x. e and log cancel each other out. Next rule, log of two terms being multiplied is equal to the sum of the individual logs. Don't forget to distribute negative signs if this is a positive 7 times negative 3. This is going to turn subtraction. Next rule that comes up very often, division. Then it's going to be the log of the numerator minus the log of the denominator. Next rule that comes up a lot, log of a number to some power is equal to that power times the log of the number. These are the rules. And these can be manipulated to transform equations and functions from one form to another to help us out. Most people use them this way. The thing is, they go backwards as well. So look for where you have logs being added together can you just do this instead? If logs are being subtracted, maybe you want to write it like this. If you have this, you rarely want to put the power back up there on top. But if you have this and you're thinking, how can I use the exponent? How can I use the exponent? Well, if I have b log a, what I might want to do, log a to the b, and that means I'm just going to bring in my exponent power now the e and log cancel, and I just have a to the b. So when it comes to rules of logs, these are the rules. Um, this video is definitely not going to be long enough to go over why these rules are the way they are. Uh, I know you can find videos that show how to do that. I just want to make this video any longer than it already is. So I hope that explained what we did in that problem and how it was reduced the way it was reduced, and maybe a little bit of why it was reduced the way it was reduced, of what the problems were that we ran into were. So good luck. Hope you do well. Hope I do well. Bye.